things where we're working our way through Acts, which um, is is right up there with one of my favourite uh, books in the Bible. There's just so much action, um, but uh, and also as well, I was chatting to Pip the other night, and he said. You say um a lot in your talks. Um, I'm actually going to count how many times you said it, and now it's in my head, and I've said it about seven times already, so uh, I'll stop that. But if there's awkward pauses, it's because I'm trying not to say um. Yeah, so Acts 17, we're going to pull out a couple of lessons, um, mainly from the Thessalonians, uh, but also from the Bereans and the Athenians. So the, the title Seed Pickers or Planters really came from verse 18, where it says, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities uh, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So this word babbler, the actual meaning of it is seed picker, which the idea behind seed picker was that the Epicureans and Stoics were lightning pull to this bird that's in the marketplace, going all over the place, trying to pick a seed here, pick a seed there, get an idea from somewhere, get an idea from somewhere else. Uh, and, and really trying to take all these spiritual ideas to create a religious belief to make himself sound smart or of importance. Think about this idea for, for us, if, if we were to describe ourselves as seed pickers, it's you know picking all these ideas uh, from different places, maybe using the world's influence to formulate our views, even if they aren't aligned to what the Bible says. Maybe there are other denominations who do something and we'll, we'll pick a little bit about there. Maybe it's just society in general. And we pick these ideas and like the bird, never settle. But Paul, conversely, uh, describes himself as a seed planter in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, where he says, I, Paul, I talking about Paul, uh, planted, Apollo uh, watered, but God gave the growth or the increase. So as I said, Acts 17 tonight is, is where we read about the three different cities, uh, the Thessalonians, the Bereans, and the Athenians. And we're going to look at six different characteristics of what a seed planter would show. So there's six different characteristics that we can take out from uh, mainly the Thessalonian Ecclesia, uh, but these three, these six different characteristics that we can show. Because there are these contrasting ideas between the seed pickers, which were, I I guess, more like the Athenians and and how they had their various idols and gods, as it says in verse uh, 21. But the seed planters, which were more like the Thessalonians and the Bereans, who it says about both of them, received the word and grew from it. So, you know, if we just sort of take these ideas and try to formulate them a little bit, if you think about the contrast between a seed picker or a seed planter, a picker, a bird that's going around, is only looking out for themselves, aren't they? They're trying to get their own little bit that suits themselves. Whereas a seed planter is outward focus, so focused on other things, trying to create uh, something else. A picker's never settled, they're always moving around, always trying to look for the next best thing, whereas a planter is looking for the right thing, trying to find the, the soil that is perfect, focused on developing, focused on growing. A picker is momentarily satisfied. A planter produces something that's lasting, something that can produce more seeds, something that grows and something that can regenerate. And we know that you know the seed represents the word of God. So if you're planting a seed, it means that you're, you're preaching or you're putting it in an environment where it's going to grow, which is exactly what we see Paul doing in this chapter. One of the key points about the gospel uh, and being a Bible believer is there's this direction of travel of the gospel. And we're going to see that, that firstly, the gospel, it, it comes to us, it, it works in us, and then it comes out of us. So there's this, these three stages that really are quite aligned to what a planter would do, as we'll see. So tonight we're going to contrast the ideas of a seed picker and a seed planter. But before we do that, I think it's important that we actually get a little bit of context to this chapter. So feel free to uh, whip back to Acts 15 if you like. Uh, Acts 15 verse 36, Paul says to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. And as we know, there was a sharp disagreement between Mark and they went their separate ways. Barnabas sailed off to Cyprus like in the first journey and Paul and Silas, verse 41, went up into Syria and uh, Cilicia. They continued on to Acts uh, uh, 16 verse 1. 
as, it, as I've uh, got up there in a very small line, so hopefully you can see that at the back. He ca they came to Derby and Lystra. If we skip on to verse 6, it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and Galatia, they are forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach in Asia. So they've gone to um, go through Asia, but they were um, forbidden from doing that. So after that, they came to Mycenae. They are saved to go in Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. So passing by Mycenae, they came to Trias, which is right over on uh, the left-hand side there. So this amazing thing happens in Trias after the Spirit had already forbidden them to preach. Verse 9, they're given this vision from Paul where this certain man of Macedonia came over uh, saying, come over Macedonia and help us. Verse 10 speaks of their response to the vision. Immediately they sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called them to preach. So they set sail from Trias, went to Samothrace, then came across to Neapolis and from thence to Philippi. They stayed in Philippi for a little bit. That's the story of the, uh, uh, the ecclesia over there, the story of Paul and Silas in, the, in jail uh, with the earthquake. And then after that, they were begged to leave Philippi. So they um, checked in with the ecclesia and then they continued their journey until they arrived to Thessalonica, which is right over there. I've got a new little laser pointer, which is green. And then after Thessalonica, they go to Berea and then make their way down to Athens. So that's a little bit of the, the history from where they've gone to. Uh, and it, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because where they'd wanted to go preach and where um, you know, God wanted them to preach was a little bit uh, misaligned at the beginning, but it forces their way there. So if we look at the three cities uh, in, in the chapter, let's, let's begin uh, verse 1 of Acts chapter 17, because there's a, a little lesson about Paul that I think we want to call out, first of all. Acts 17 verse 1. It says, after they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So the first lesson that we want to take out, because it says clearly there, as was his custom, or as was his manner, or as was his habit. So those who knew Paul would know that he was going to visit a synagogue the moment that he landed at this city. They knew on the Sabbath what he was going to be doing. It's something that others could predict and see. For Jesus, we're actually told a couple of times what his custom was. In Luke 4, verse 16, it says that Jesus, as was his custom, um, opened up the, uh, the scrolls to read. Mark 10, verse 1, it says that Jesus' custom was to teach. And Luke 22, verse 39, his custom was to withdraw uh, to the Mount of Olives and pray. So I guess our, our first questions for ourselves, you know, do, do you have any habits? Do you have any customs? And, and what, are, what are the things that people would say about you? What would people say that their custom is doing this? Would they say your custom is attendance? Would they say your custom is talking about the Bible? Is your custom looking out for others and providing hospitality? What's your custom? So we're going to have six steps uh, to be a seed planter, and our first step is to have a custom and a habit. So a little bit about the Thessalonian Ecclesia. They are a really vibrant Ecclesia. That became a really great preaching Ecclesia that stood up for Christ. From my, uh, my understanding, Paul only spends about three weeks in this city. The letter to the Thessalonians was written around about a year later, uh, and, and we're going to see that they are this really vibrant and committed ecclesia that hadn't stagnated at all in the, uh, in the year that had passed. So how did they do it? How did they keep the ecclesia vibrant? How did they keep their motivation so high? Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time in uh, First Thessalonians chapter 1, so if you want to come across there now, and while you're going there, I'm, I'm just going to read out Acts 17 verse 3 because it, it says there that Paul explained and proved from the Bible and some of them were per, uh, persuaded and were convinced. And we see that in, uh, when we come to 1 Thessalonians. So 1 first, first Thessalonians 1 verse 5, it says, Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So the verse tells us that the gospel needs to be our gospel. You know, it's not, it's not something that's distant. It's not something that you look at and think about. 
The gospel is something that needs to be a part of who you are. It needs to be yours or, or ours. Our people need to be able to look at us and actually see the gospel. They need to see the way that we're living is in line with the gospel. And if they're looking at us, they're seeing the gospel. But it also says that it came not only in word. And I think it's important that we don't gloss over that because it absolutely did come in word. Saying that it, it not only came in word means that it did come in word, but not exclusively. And that's important for two things. Firstly, whenever there's any sort of preaching, there must be words that are included. So if we're at work, school, uni, um, at the shops, whatever it is, we can't just be silent on the Bible and the fact that we're a follower of Christ. Words are absolutely required. It's not enough just to have a, um, you know, a, a good character in the, in the way that we live. Words are absolutely important. So what else is important? Well, Paul talks about the power of the Holy Spirit and a full conviction. Now, we don't have Holy Spirit gifts, which we know, which, gee, that would be mighty helpful at times, but what the apostles didn't have was the Bible to actually help them uh, to, to use when they're having discussions. And besides that, miracles certainly aren't the silver bullet to preaching. Even Jesus did miracles and people uh, saw them and still didn't believe, as we see in John 12, verse 37. Though he, uh, Jesus, had done many signs before them, they still didn't believe in him. So the key really was this full conviction, which just exuded from you know, Paul and Silas and all the first century ecclesias. They 100% knew that they had the truth and it just controlled their whole life and others, others noted. So we don't need to be doing anything grand. We just need to live as though we're fully convinced and we need to use our words. Uh, so it's this combination of lips and life coming together to present the gospel in an unstoppable way. There's this really great saying that uh, someone shared with me, which is people will follow your footsteps quicker than they will follow your advice. So telling people what they should or shouldn't be doing is not as effective as living a convicted life and talking in a way that promotes what the Bible has to say. So as we said, there's this, this, you know, with our lips and then also with our lives, we can't do one without the other. Because if we witness just with our lips, but not with our lives, we're, we're just being a hypocrite, aren't we? But if we witness just with our life and not our lips, that's cruelty. You know, we, um, it, it's like being that person who's got this disease that's, that can be cured, but you're not going to share with anybody else how you can get better. You're just going to live a healthy life in front of all these uh, people that are unwell. So we d discussed um, just a moment ago how the Holy Spirit guided Paul and Silas to go to, into Macedonia and the, um, and the Thessalonians. So they, they hadn't planned to receive the gospel. And most likely the majority of us uh, didn't plan to receive the gospel. Many of us were brought up in the truth. Many of us had our parents teach us from birth. And, uh, and many of us might not have had a choice in, in having the gospel uh, you know, uh, put upon us at that time, but we absolutely have the choice now. We have the choice on what we allow coming into our lives, and, and that's the first step of the, the gospel, allowing it to come into us. So the second step of being a seed planter is to be fully convicted, to make the gospel our own, and to make it the gospel our own by living and speaking about it often. So we talked about how the gospel moves in, in three steps. Well, the next step of the gospel is it, it working within us. And this is what happened with the Thessalonians. So if we have a look at, at verse 6, it says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. So for the Thessalonians, this is where the gospel starts to work within them. It literally made tangible changes in their lives. So what were some of the workings of the gospel? Well, verse 9 says, You turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. So it's a simple thing to read, but it is pretty tough. I'm, I'm sure that you've got idols in your life. I know I do. Um, the, things, the thing about idols is that they're always present. You can't ever fully escape them. And this word turned, it literally means to return, to come back, to bring back. It's, so it's not something that we can necessarily conquer once and for all and say, that's it, idols are, are done in my life. But it's, it's this active word of continuing to return um, and to turn back to God when these idols present themselves. So as I said, I have no, no idea what your idols may be. It could be sport, movies, music, TV, uni, friends at work, career, money. You know, each person is different, but each person certainly does have them. 
So getting the gospel to work in you is to have that active, active um, phase in our lives of turning away uh, from the idols and turning back to serve God. So anytime we make this decision to turn away from an idol when it consumes our life and turn back to God is allowing the gospel to change us. It's a part of growing and regenerating. So our, our third step is to turn from the temporary things and back to God. So the next thing that they did was in verse 10. It says, uh, And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So they turned from idols to God, and then in anticipation, they waited for Jesus to come. How often do you think about the return of Christ and actually thinking about Jesus returning? Like, I know that we've, we've obviously all got it as a goal um, and, and, you know, it's our hope. It's, it's, we know it's going to happen. We know it's a, the purpose and we, we talk about it often. Uh, but how often do you actually just, just sit there and, and actually just think about Jesus returning rather than it be something that you know is going to happen, just to meditate on him, to think, think often about it? You may have heard of this before, uh, but in Thessalonians, every single chapter has a reference to Jesus returning. In, uh, it's not in just first, Thess- first of Thessalonians, it's also in second of Thessalonians. And each one has this sort of different reference and context behind it. Uh, 1 verse 10, it, it talks about how when Jesus returns, we'll be delivered from the wrath and the turmoil that is coming. 2 verse 19 talks about how when Jesus returns, we're going to see people that we haven't seen for ages. So, you know, those friends at a Bible school or, or um, you know, uh, people who used to come to our, our meeting but they've moved to another e- ecclesia. Uh, friends from interstate that we haven't seen for a while. Maybe it was at a you know conference or um, or something like that. So it's it's about being reunited with those friends that we don't get a chance to see all that often. Uh, chapter three verse thirteen talks about we'll be presented blameless and holy. Chapter four verse fifteen to sixteen says how we're going to see our loved ones, those ones that have died, and we're going to be reunited with them. Chapter five verse two talks about how Jesus is going to return suddenly like a thief in the night. Chapter 2, uh, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7 says how Jesus is going to come with his mighty angels to grant us relief. Chapter 2 verse 1 talks about how we're going to be gathered together. And 3 verse 1, how we're going to receive the love of God and awaiting Christ for us. So there are just some things that we can meditate on and think about how when Jesus will come, um, you know, all of these, these things will change in our life. And if we focus on that, it's going to change the way that we look at things now. It's going to change the way that we react to things. So if we consider ways to keep Jesus at the front of our mind, that's going to change our state of mind just like it did uh, for the Thessalonians. So our fourth step there is to look for the return of Christ. So how else did the gospel at work change the state of mind of the Thessalonians? Well, uh, verse 6 says... And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So there's two states that are mentioned in this verse. There's being in the state of affliction and there's being in the state of joy. The Thessalonians were in the middle of affliction, yet they were joyful, they were celebrating. Being in affliction or being at rock bottom, you can have two ways to view your situation. We can focus on the problem or problems, or we can focus on the opportunity. And, and we know that can sound heartless because sometimes affliction and being at rock bottom is this cold, dark and lonely place. And sometimes you, you can never really escape it entirely. But all of us have been in some sort of affliction and some may be in it right now. Others may be sitting in affliction with somebody trying to support them. Others may be just standing in the clear sun. But some of the traps that we can fall into when we're in affliction is to focus on ourselves like a seed picker. And we can focus on the challenges that we're in. We can focus on what's gone wrong. Focus on wishing that the affliction was fixed. Uh, Thinking about how other people never seem to have anything wrong. Thinking that no matter what, there's uh, nothing good happening. But there's nothing good on focusing on the afflictions and wishing they are different. Because just doing that doesn't actually change anything. It doesn't help your headspace. It doesn't improve the situation. Um, and, and quite often it can contribute to a downward spiral. 
The word joy here means a calm delight. It's this idea of focusing on the comforts of the gospel. Being a seed planter is knowing that affliction is momentary, but joy is eternal. It's knowing that you can regenerate after the storm has passed. On the topic of our plants and, and, uh, and affliction, there was this experiment that was done, uh, I'm not too sure how long ago, but it was, uh, it was done where there's these trees and these plants that were growing in this, uh, they called it a biodome. Everything was perfect. All the conditions, there was the perfect amount of sun, there was a perfect amount of water, the perfect amount of temperature, perfect amount of soil, everything was optimised uh, for the plant. They were, they were grown in this fully protected orb. Nothing could get at them. These plants, they, they grew faster than any other tree, any other uh, tree that was in their species, but they never matured. And they actually fell over before they became too old. And the reason is that they weren't exposed to any wind. And as a result, these trees never built strength within them to grow and mature. There's a couple of uh, verses that I think are, are fantastic about being afflicted and, and, and how it can help us. Because if we're focused on growing and developing like a seed planter, we know that afflictions can sometimes turn us away from sin. Psalm 119 verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. Being a seed planter is knowing that affliction shapes our character. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace by those who have been trained by it. Being a seed planter is knowing that the affliction that we're going through can equip us to help others who will soon be going through that same trial. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So the way that the gospel works in us is, as we said, allowing us to turn away from idols, uh, to, to focus on Jesus returning, and that means that we can turn our affliction into joy. And that's not necessarily an immediate thing, but it's having an, an understanding and, rem and realising that the affliction will eventually turn into joy. So the gospel comes to you, it works in you, and then it comes out of you. So let's have a look at that in this, uh, this next step. So verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. So if you've got a coloured pencil, it's worth actually linking the word to in verse 5 to the word from in verse 8, as these are the bookends in the way that the gospel works. This word soundeth forth is this Greek word echiomai, which literally means to echo forth. An echo is a sound that continues to re reverberate around and around, or as it says, reverberate to Macedonia and Achaia. So the, this Thessalonian ecclesia, they weren't focused on themselves. They weren't content to just be saved by themselves. They wanted to maximise the amount of people that are saved. They weren't focused on picking a seed here and there for themselves. They wanted to plant seeds and grow a jungle. Their message and example echoed forth. So thinking about the, some of the ways that we can deal with this world and the way that we live in, um, and the challenges both perceived and real that we put ourselves in, what are some of the different ways that we can deal with the unbelieving world around us? Well, one of the ways is we can isolate. You know, we can say the, the world is a, a terrible place. We're going to buy a house in the country. We're going to have no dealings with the world. We're going to live completely off grid and off the land. Or we can separate. So we can just surround ourselves with believers and have no interaction with the world. We can stay in our little cocoon only speaking to fellow Christadelphians. We can imitate. So unless the world sees eye to eye with us, unless they see me as a friend, they're not going to listen to me. So I need to be like them, do the things that they do, and then they're going to listen to me. Or we can stagnate. And this is that apathetic believer. And although it's pretty blunt and we'd never say it out loud, it's, it's, it's saying, I know people don't know, but, but so what? And none of these are really acceptable, are they? Uh, when, when we think that Jesus says to us, go into all the world and preach the good news. Uh, if we want to be a seed planter, because if we think about Jesus, 
he didn't take himself away and sit in a cave by himself and, and isolate himself from the rest of the world just to focus on not sinning. Jesus didn't separate himself and just interact with his disciples and fellow believers. Jesus said that he himself came into the world to save sinners. Jesus didn't try to imitate the world. In fact, he said the world hates him and would hate us uh, if we don't belong with the world. And Jesus didn't stagnate. He came to say everyone who was lost is constant, constantly mentioned throughout that he was moved with compassion. So the last option that we have is that we can communicate to those around us. We can, we can let everyone know that we're a Christadelphian. We can let everyone know that we stand with Christ and that we have a hope. We can let everyone know that we don't have the answers, but we know for sure that Jesus will come back and completely change the world for better. And because of that, you know that everything is momentary in this life and you have a purpose in the way that you live. Chances are in this crazy messed up world that people will be pretty interested and and actually want to know more. Come back to Acts chapter 17, just in, uh, in conclusion. Because we're just going to quickly touch on the Berean Ecclesia. The Berean Ecclesia were very much aligned with the Thessalonian Ecclesia, but there's also one additional characteristic that they showed. It says that they received the word with all eagerness in verse 11. This word eagerness means to be always ready, to be willing, to have zeal, to be inclined. So it wasn't something that they felt that they had to do or were begrudging of it or it's just something that they've always done. Now they received the word with zeal and enthusiasm uh, to ensure that they actually understood the truth. So our last step uh, to becoming a seed planter is to sound forth eagerly. So it's about uh, that, that outworking and looking out to others. So that gives us our six steps to be a, a, a seed planter like Paul and the Thessalonians and the Brands. So if we recap on what they are, it's we need to have a custom to do things repetitively and to be known for it. We need to be fully convicted by making the gospel our own. We need to continually be temp- uh, turning away from the temporary things that the idols uh, present themselves with and continually return to God. We need to look for the return of Christ and actually just consider, remember it in our day-to-day life and to meditate on it. And we need to turn affliction into joy, realising that all affliction has a purpose and all afflictions are momentary. And we need to sound forth eagerly. We need to tell others willingly and with zeal. So let's go out and be seed planters and don't forget you can literally do that as well.